many things to talk about here. Maybe the first thing, just to clear off an important concept of the Inferno as a whole, to talk a little bit about the contrapasso. The term contrapasso is invented by Dante, and it enters the poem in the 28th canto of the Inferno when Dante meets Bertrand de Born, whose sin was causing hatred between a son and his father. And his punishment in hell is to have his head cut off. And uh, it's just like, uh, you know, the Green Knight, in Gowan and the Green Knight. He holds his head up. Uh, Dante and Virgil are on a bridge over the ditch, and he holds his head up, and the head speaks to him, speaks to Dante. And he says, So servan me lo contrapasso. In me is seen the contrapasso. So it's not easy to translate counter-suffering. That would be sort of the very literal way, counter-penalty. It means the suiting of the punishment to the crime. It's a kind of uh, artistic device by which Dante makes the punishments related to the sins which the various souls have committed. Harriet uh, Rubin has a very elegant way of uh, defining it, an act of divine justice that directs the essence of a crime back against the perpetrator. Well, obviously there is a kind of contrapasso, a kind of idea of retribution that comes from the Old Testament. A retribution means, you know, to pay back, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So that's one type of contrapasso that you find in the Inferno, it's Sharia law. It's what everybody in the U.S. is afraid of, you know, that the Muslims are going to take over the country and impose Sharia law. Well, Sharia law, strict uh, Islamic law, you know, if you cut somebody's hand off, the punishment is your hand is cut off. It's just a strict payback for, for the crime that's committed. So that's one type of contrapostle that you find in the Inferno. Bertrand de Born is a good example of that because metaphorically the father is the head of the uh, son uh, just like the head is the head of the body and so to, to cause discord or hatred between a father and son is like having your head cut off, right? The family has its head cut off. And so that's uh, his punishment. The suicides we'll see are people who have committed suicide their punishment is to be transformed into trees. So they have destroyed their body, so in the afterlife they have no body. They have no human body. They're just a, a bush or a tree. Fortune teller is the most obvious one. They try to look forward, to see the future, and so their punishment is their heads are twisted, always looking backwards. So they have to walk along, I can't do it, you know, but all the way back, and then they're walking along like this because they're not, they can never look forward again. So those are examples of retributive, this eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the lex talionis it's called, the, the law of the tally. Another type of uh, contrapasso that you find in the uh, inferno is not, no good term for it, so I call it karmic contrapasso. Uh, you won't find anybody else calling it that. I don't think. The punishment presents an image of the offense. That is, the situation of these souls is an extension and intensification of their behavior in the world. And that's like the idea of karma, right? A person who is violent in this life might be reincarnated as a wolf or a tiger, might be reincarnated as a violent animal, right? And so we find, for example, the blasphemer, Caponaeus, uh, who attacks God with words, he's still cursing Jupiter. He's lying on his back, you know, he can't move, but he's still cursing God, cursing the God of Roman mythology, which for Dante is just as bad or almost as bad as cursing the Christian God, and so Caponaeus is punished for his blasphemy of Jupiter. And he says, that which I was in life, I am in death. That's sort of parallel, I think, to in me is is seen the contrapasso. I mean, here's a, a different relationship, similar but, but significantly different. The punishment is that the, ac the actions of the sinner are extended for eternity, continuing to do uh, what they were doing. So the neutrals we saw are chasing a banner, you know, and the banner is constantly changing direction. 
So they're basically continuing to do what they did in life, because in life they were opportunists, right? They followed whatever party or whatever leader seemed to be the most uh, advantageous to them, and of course that frequently changed, and when the party changed, they changed their allegiance, and so they're rushing after this flag, and then it changes, then they rush after the flag this way, and they're just continually acting out the behavior for which they are punished in the inferno. The, the uh, lustful, I mean, I think the image of a strong wind, it hasn't been very windy lately, maybe last week it was a little windy, but sometimes when I'm teaching this class in the fall, you know, we have those tremendous winds, and, uh, you know, the students are almost blown off their bicycles getting to class, and I say, isn't this a wonderful metaphor for not being able to control where you want to go? And, and so for Dante, you know, being controlled by your sexual desires is like being in a big wind. You know, your reason, uh, that's the poor guy holding onto the handlebars trying to direct the bike down the street. But the wind is forcing you left and right, forcing you to do what your reason does not wish you to do. And so they're caught in this, uh, they're caught in a kind of continual playing out of the situation of their lives. And then the wrathful, as we'll see, another couple of cantos here, are constantly angry. They're just uh, fighting with each other, constantly overcome by their anger. Although the commentators often stress the retributive kind of contrapasso, I think for the purpose of Dante's story, the karmic is more important. Because the reader like Dante is meant uh, to, Dante the Pilgrim, is meant to recognize in the various punishments, the essence of the sins with which the punishments are associated. The true stupidity and ugliness and cruelty and brutality of the behavior associated with the sins is vividly presented. And like Dante the Pilgrim, the reader is meant to see those types of behavior, understand them, witness the results, and reject them. Right? So this is the way in which Dante's uh, uh, poem is meant to change the attitudes and the behavior of the readers. He's got a design upon us to educate us and to make us uh, better people. So the karmic presentations of the punishments in hell are more than just fantasies of an afterlife. Uh, that's why, you know, it's my whole point, and one of the main points of this class, you don't have to read the Divine Comedy and say, gee, you know, this is like a, somebody's imagination of a world that doesn't exist uh, from the point of view of a religion that I cannot accept and therefore it has nothing to say to me, right? And I hope, I hope uh, that point becomes clear. So the situations of the Inferno represent the consequences of the bad choices that uh, the sinners had made while they were alive, right? And if the uh, journey into hell is a journey into the varieties of evil, in the human personality, the situations of the sinners represent all of the ways in which readers of the comedy can make themselves miserable here and now. When I was about your age, I almost married a girl that I was very much in love with, basically because she was very attractive to me, right? We had nothing in common. Now I know, if I had done that, I would have been miserable the rest of my life, right? I, or maybe divorced, who knows? You know, so I mean, it, it's not uh, totally irrelevant to your own uh, situation. I'm not saying that's your situation, but I mean, imagine, you know, uh, you're, you're strongly attracted to someone, you've got nothing, no other reason, and you end up marrying that person? You know, how long is that going to last? That'd be like a hell on earth, right? So this is, uh, this is what Dante is talking about. So remember the purpose of the poem, as is stated in Dante's own preface to the Paradiso, in Epistle de Condrande. We can say briefly that the purpose of the whole, as well as the part, is to remove those living in this life from the state of misery and to lead them to a state of bliss. So it has a relevance to this life, as well as to the future life. There's Doré's, uh, seems to me, rather majestic illustration of Dante and Virgil seeing the lustful being blown in this wind. These are the souls here. There's Dante and Virgil they got themselves out on a kind of cliff there, looking into the vastness of the underworld. Something about courtly love and uh, the specific variety of courtly love poetry that Dante 
practiced, or at least claimed he practiced, Il Dolce Stil Novo. This is the literary tradition, the sweet new style. Dante uses the term in the Purgatorio. A kind of poetry that was practiced by a group of young Florentines who wrote elegant analyses of their sentiments of romantic love. And the kind of courtly love poetry that Dante himself practiced in his early writing, including in the Vita Nuova. What were the essential themes? Well, they were the essential themes of courtly love. The poet's lady was raised to the status of a quasi-divine being, an angel, almost a god. And romantic love, it was thought, ennobles those who are involved in the love affair. Arnaud Daniel, whom Dante meets, the soul of whom Dante meets in the... Uh, top terrace of the Purgatorio. Here's a poem written in Provençal, which uh, I can't read very well and which you probably think looks very strange. It's kind of a mix of French and Italian. Every day I grow better and purer, for I worship the most noble being in the world. I may tell you this openly. I am hers from foot to head, and however cold the wind blows, the love that reigns in my heart keeps me warm in the worst of winter. So there's this idea, I worship the most noble being in the world, and it makes him better and purer, this love that he has. Guido Guinzelli, who Dante says was the founder of this type of poetry, the Deep Dolce Stil Nuovo, this is a little bit longer one on two parts, it's longer than this, I cut out the middle, here is the al cor gentil repare sempre amore. Love shelters within the noble heart as birds within the green shade of the wood. Before the noble heart, make nature made not love, nor before love did she make the noble heart. So this is clearly noble here. Gentil means, you know, the, uh, not only noble in terms of birth, but also noble in terms of character. But again, there is definitely a kind of class implication to this. Peasants generally could not or did not love. And then the last part is a kind of dialogue between the poet and God. My lady, the poem is addressed to uh, Guinzelli's uh, beloved, my lady, God shall ask, how did you dare when my soul stands before his presence? So he imagines himself dying and going to the last judgment and God asks him, You've passed through heaven into my sight who gave your love to my empty image. To me the praise belongs and to the worthy queen of the realm. If you're going to worship a woman, at least make it the Virgin Mary, right? Not this earthly woman that you fell in love with. You've passed through heaven into my sight who gave uh, your love to my empty image. To me the praise belongs and to the worthy queen of the realm through whom all fraud is destroyed. Then I may plead, this is the poet, she had an angel's face as though she came from your kingdom. Do not blame me if I placed in her my love. So the poet says, well, you know, I thought she was an angel. That's why I loved her. Don't blame me if you make her that beautiful and that noble if I fell in love with her with uh, all my heart. Dante himself in the Vita Nuova, many poems you could quote, this is one of the more beautiful. The power of love, born in my lady's eyes, imparts its grace to all she looks upon. All turn to gaze at her while she walks by, and when she greets a man, his heart beats fast. The color leaves his face, he bows his head, and sighs to think of all his faults. Anger and pride are forced to flee from her. So when you're in the presence of this beautiful woman, you think of all of the things that you are guilty of, and you resolve to do better. It makes you a better person. Humility and every sweet conception bloom in the heart of those who hear her speak. Praise to the one who first saw what she was. Her image, when she starts to smile, dissolves within the mind and melts away. A miracle, too rich and strange to hold. Miracle there, really, in the religious sense, you know, something beyond normal something beyond what nature can provide, like a religious miracle. 
Of course, there was a conflict between courtly love and Christian morality. Because courtly love allowed for sex outside of marriage. This is what we see in Paolo Francesca. Most marriages, we've said this before, were arranged by the parents. They were not based on the attraction of the couple for each other. Dante's own marriage was arranged when he was only 12 years old. So he had no choice. Uh, he had to marry Gemma Donati, right? He had no choice in his wife. Andrea says in uh, The Art of Courtly Love, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The most famous affair in medieval romance is the affair between Lancelot and Gwyneth. But, of course, in Christian, Christian morality, adultery is a deadly sin, one of the seven most uh, deadly sins. Two solutions to this conflict were developed. One, an ad an entirely idealized, non-physical relationship. That's how Dante solves the problem. Dante and Beatrice's love was platonic, not physical, right? Cervantes mocks this kind of uh, ethereal relationship in the relationship between Don Quixote and his uh, Dulcinea. A second way it is solved is through this love leading to marriage. It's got all of the courtly love characteristics, think of that fantastically beautiful scene in Romeo and Juliet where Romeo goes to the party and, uh, you know, Juliet uh, uh, gives him his, her hand, you know, and he says, you know, this fair shrine, he worships the hand as though it were a religious shrine, and he says that his lips are pilgrims, you know, making their journey to Juliet, but, of course, it ends with them getting married. All of Shakespeare's romantic comedies end with marriage, and sometimes more than one marriage. Almost every novel, the 18th and 19th centuries, ends with marriage. Almost every popular film, TV series, even today, that's the solution to the conflict between this idea of love as an ideal and the fact that love outside of marriage is a sin. So therefore, one way of looking at the comedy is to see it as Dante's attempt to reconcile the focus of his courtly love poetry with the results of his study of theology. So as the Francesca episode implies, Dante has residual feelings of guilt, right? Look at that, what she said about her affair, right? A gaio, indeed, that book and he who wrote it, right? So it's the author of the romance, according to Francesca. Now, of course, this is not uh, uh, strictly uh, the reason, but at least uh, it's part of the reason. So uh, Dante, uh, par part of the reason that he faints is that you know he's moved by the tragedy of the story of the lovers, but also because he feels himself Im implicated in the situation as a writer of courtly love poetry early in his career, right? Boccaccio, in his Life of Dante, says, Amid so great virtue, amid so much learning, as we have seen was the portion of this wondrous poet, licentiousness, found a large place. And this not only in his youth, but also in his maturity. So here is one of Dante's own sins coming into his work. Determinism and free will. It's interesting Francesca presents herself as an innocent victim of circumstances, right? This love has been determined. As a warm-hearted person, she couldn't help returning the love of Paolo, who, as a noble person, could not help falling in love with her. Look at those poems uh, that I was just quoting, right? The love shelters within the noble heart as birds within the green shade of the wood. It's just automatic, if you are a person of noble birth and character, you're going to fall in love. And so she argues that this sexual attraction was an overpowering, irresistible force. Before they first made love, they were reading a book which eloquently describes a kiss between the world's two most famous lovers. Natural instinct took over. They were victims of forces beyond their control. Love took hold of him. Love took hold of me. Love led the two of us. So the implication is love, some kind of external force, is the cause of what happened between Francesca and Paolo. She seems to claim there was no human agency 
There was no human responsibility in the affair. There was an outside force that caused this to happen. And the most interesting thing is that Dante the Pilgrim seems to accept what we call today framing, or framing of the events. This is a term that's come into Western political discourse, talking about the way in which uh, political issues are discussed. Each of the uh, major political parties in the U.S. now in the midst of this election cycle are trying to frame certain issues, trying to present those issues in a way that prejudices the electorate's interpretation of the issue. So I've, I've looked around and I found this uh, definition in the book on uh, rhetorical criticism. Framing is a process whereby communicators, consciously or unconsciously, act to construct a point of view that encourages the facts of a given situation to be interpreted by others in a particular manner. Another term that's sometimes used is called spin, to spin a situation or to spin uh, an event, to make it interpreted in one way or another. So Dante says, you know, with what and in what way did love allow you to recognize your still uncertain longings? So, you know, it's as though he agrees. Yes, it's love that's involved here more than you or Paolo. So according to Francesca, she and Paolo were not responsible for their actions. Their adultery was love's fault or the book's fault or the author's fault, anyone's fault but their fault. But she was a married woman. Paolo was a married man. How did they come to be alone together? Now for us, yeah, so what? You know, man and a woman, they're alone together. But in the Middle Ages, this, you've got to think now of sort of strict Islamic society where, you know, the woman is kept uh, basically in the house. You know, you don't get a woman and a man that's not her husband or, his bro or her brother or her father being alone together in, in Dante's time. So that was unusual in itself. And not only are they alone together, they're reading a book of romance. In the source of the romance, the one that uh, Dante seems to have in mind for the one that Paolo and Francesca are reading, is the prose Lancelot. It's Guinevere who kisses Lancelot. And the queen, seeing that he did not dare to go further, took him by the chin, and in the presence of Gaio, kissed him quite a long time. So, <laughs> you know... Even, I don't know if whether the readers uh, of the original text were supposed to remember this or not, but it throws a kind of light on the fact that maybe Francesca's not telling the whole truth about who was the one that initiated this kiss. And moreover, of course, what about free will? That's what you have to ask yourself, which Dante considered to be the greatest gift of God to human beings. And if Francesca and Paolo were innocent, how is it that they end up in hell? So that's the question you always have to ask. Because Dante allows the sinners in his inferno to be very eloquently persuasive in defending their actions. It's never their fault. You know, it was, they're down there, they don't know why. You know, how did I end up here? Why has this happened to me? And he can do that because he assumes that the reader will realize that they wouldn't be there if they were innocent. So it creates a highly effective dramatic irony. We know that they're guilty. They try to convince us that they're innocent. The souls of the damned refuse to admit their responsibility to continue justifying their actions, but the reader knows their excuses cannot be valid. valid. So in modern narrative terminology, they're all unreliable narrators, right? They're telling their story, but we can't agree with it. We can't accept their version of the events. Dante author can allow the sinners complete liberty to defend themselves as they spin the stories of their crimes because he knows the careful reader will recognize their arguments must be specious. It's a nice word. Fair seeming but false. Francesca, one of the greatest presentations in European literature of personality through monologue. Chaucer's wife of Bath, Chaucer's partner, I think Chaucer may have got his ideas for these prologues, these self-revealing prologues from Dante's uh, conversations with the souls in his afterlife, Shakespeare's soliloquies, Browning's dramatic monologues. You know, this is a long tradition of uh, a person, a character in literature who speaks in monologue 
and uh, through his monologue gives us oftentimes an idea of his or her character which is at odds with the impression that they wish to create. Think of the wife of Bath, you know, she's defending her, her life with her five husbands and the reader is thinking, oh, you know, this woman or the partner, he's, you know, bragging about how uh, skillful and smart he is and the reader realizes what a villain he is. As he's defending himself, we are seeing things in what he says or Browning's, uh, you know, My Last Duchess, the Duke is, uh, is describing what happened and we know what happened was something very, very uh, different. So Dante excels in creating characters towards whom the reader must have conflicting responses. Francesca is condemned to hell by Dante the theologian because she's an adulteress, yet Dante the poet describes her love in the most beautiful language. I think this canto contains some of the most beautiful poetry in the entire commedia, right? And it's surprising because it's hell, right? You wouldn't expect uh, such lyrical, such uh, beautiful uh, description in the Inferno, maybe in Paradiso, uh, and there is a lot in Paradiso. Uh, but here, such beautiful language. And then, of course, Dante the Pilgrim, the fictional character, passes out because he pities her tragedy uh, so greatly. Is this Dante's most perfect line of verse? I tried to actually sit down yesterday and work this out, why I like this so much. E cadi come corpo morto cade. It's got everything, you know. It's got internal rhyme, cadi, cade, corpo, morto. And this is a framing. This is a framing line. This word and that word rhyme. So it's sort of like cadi, cade. It's like it's uh, enclosing the whole line in a beautiful sense of... I mean, the, the, the line closes off the canto. It closes off the uh, story of Francesca and Paolo. But the line itself has a kind of closure because the first word or the second word and the last word are almost the same word, right? Cadi, cade. It's got assonance with those O's, it's got alliteration, and it's got this stately rhythm, cadi, come, corpo, morto, cade. So uh, it seems to me uh, uh, something that is really not written about that much. If you go to the internet, uh, if you go to the Dante Encyclopedia, try to find information about Dante's prosody, the actual rhythm of his lines. There's a lot about the terza rima stanza, there's a lot about the structure of the cantos and so forth, but on the level of the line, uh, not as much as you would expect, at least uh, in recent criticism. 